Thanks for having me. Um, I don't actually lead design. We have a director of design. Um, we'll show you a picture. Some of you who are at CCA might recognize him. Um, and we pulled him out of a faculty position. Anyway, um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm actually a repeat speaker at this series. I was here a long time ago and I was working on a very different product. Um, so I'm happy to be back. So let's talk about aviation. That's the world that I'm working in now. Um, so when Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Paris in 1927, it seemed like the whole world was going to shrink because of aviation. And we were at the beginning of this new era. Things were becoming more accessible. People were pumped. The world was really changing. Um, and then what that inspired over the next few decades were all these fantastic ideas about how flight, how aviation was going to enter our everyday lives and change them. It was going to become personal. We were going to be flying ourselves even across town. This is an ad concept from uh, 1958, 60 years ago. Some people thought we were going to use helicopters to get to work. This is actually from a book. You remember the little golden books when you were a kid? This is from the little golden book of helicopters that was all about how we were at this new beginning of how helicopters were going to be used. And Hiller Aviation, which is a Bay Area pioneering aviation company, introduced the first uh, coaxial rotor helicopter in the United States. Uh, they even marketed their machines like this, like you were going to have a helicopter in every garage. Flying cars, why not? Um, Turns out they're not very good airplanes and they're not very good cars. But this is the 1954 Taylor Aero Car. Um, and there have been more since then. So what happened? Is this the experience that we have with aviation today? Not really. It's more like this. Um, it's not personal. It's not flexible. You go from airport to airport. Lots of people are in the same airplane together. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why. Uh, Aviation stayed expensive and it stayed limited, even though people were excited for it to become this very personal, very everyday experience. A lot of reasons. One, becoming a pilot is difficult and expensive. It takes years. It takes a lot of hours in the seat to get a pilot's license, and that's expensive. Um, buying an airplane is expensive. They're in low volume. Um, you know, they're in low volumes because they're expensive and because of the regulatory burden of getting a new aircraft to the to the market, they stay expensive. Um, they're expensive to operate because the stakes are high. Failure is catastrophic. And so there's a lot of preemptive maintenance and inspection that happens all the time. And there's a lot of complexity. You know, Engine needs inspection, a lot of flaps, actuators. There's just a lot going on. Um, do they go point to point? Not really. Can't easily fly from my house to my friend's house across town. And then developing a new aircraft is, uh, is difficult and an expensive proposition. But there are some reasons to be hopeful. There are some technology trends happening now that are really exciting. And they apply to aviation, but a lot of other industries too. Um, these are the ones that got my co-founder, Clint, and I thinking about what we could do. Number one, uh, electric mobility happening in cars, starting to happen in aviation a little bit, but you know, great, you know, batteries, motors, motor control. It's really ent uh, entering this new era. Uh, autonomous flight. You've all seen little drones flying around with cameras on them. Turns out the same basic principles of autonomous flight and multi-rotor control do scale up. And then perception. Uh, the cars that you see driving around town that are learning how to be autonomous have these sensors all over them. And a lot of them have LIDAR, which is a light-based, laser-based way of seeing the world. And in order to be deployed on cars in the future, these sensors have to come down to a couple hundred dollars per sensor. Right now, they're more expensive than that. But because the automotive industry is so large, everybody's trying to get the prices down. So how, do we, how can we now address those problems with aviation being expensive and limited with what's available now? Well, becoming a pilot, uh, let's enable more pilots to fly, uh, or fewer pilots to fly a greater number of aircraft. 
there is a pilot shortage. If you talk to any cargo airline, they just can't find enough pilots because it's so hard for people to get pilot's licenses. But with autonomy and partial autonomy, one pilot can manage more aircraft. Um, buying an airplane, don't buy one. Share it, operate it as a service. Um, operating the airplane being expensive, we can now simplify the machine, replacing expensive components, uh, uh, or replacing mechanically complicated components with simpler ones, like engines with motors, mechanical actuation with more software control. Um, operating point to point, yes, vertical takeoff and landing, um, which is an old idea. Helicopters are vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, but now we can do it with multi-rotor systems that are a lot more fault tolerant. And then finally, developing a new airplane from scratch it's still kind of difficult and expensive, that's true, but it is getting better and cheaper because we can simulate things uh, more fully, model them, do airflow analysis, fluid dynamics, and strains and structures and vibration, all before investing the money in actually building the thing. So what's next in aviation? There's a lot of excitement about air taxis. Uber is working on it. Kitty Hawk is working on it. Joby Aviation is working on it. Um, I'm really excited about this too, but I don't think this happens first because there's a very high bar for safety in flying human beings from one place to another. And that's gonna take time to get through a regulatory process. So what we decided to do was cargo. So my company, Elroy Air, is building a autonomous cargo aircraft to take a couple hundred pounds of cargo over 300 mile or less trips. And cargo is not as sexy as carrying people, but I really believe this is next. This will happen first. And we'll start the next wave of aerospace here with cargo. So where is it gonna happen first? I had conversations with the FAA, whose job is all about safety. They don't want planes to crash. And if you think about it, flying an air taxi from the rooftop of you know, a building in San Francisco over to a parking structure in Berkeley is gonna be great because you don't have to sit on the Bay Bridge, but that's like the double black diamond safety case <laughs> for aviation because there are people on board. The entire trip, except when you're over the water, is over a dense urban city center. Nothing can go wrong. So I think the first place that we're gonna see this new wave of aviation is places like this. This is an airstrip in the Alaskan backcountry. There are a lot of little villages all over Alaska that get served by air cargo every day, about 120 of these villages. They get food, they do everyday supplies, the same aircraft go and supply people for hunting and fishing expeditions. If you look at it, there is nobody down here on the ground. So it's a very low risk place to start doing operation of new kinds of aviation. And we do, ethnography and we go and look at, at scenarios like this and talk to people in places like this to figure out where the best use cases are. And so industrial sites like mines, uh, oil rigs, there's this old saying about robotics that it's good for the dull, dirty, and dangerous use cases. And uh, bush planes are pretty dangerous. This is a picture of a, another company called Zipline that's doing great work doing medical supply delivery in Rwanda right now. Um, and this is another good place where the roads are not good. There's a need for more high-performing cargo logistics. Um, and so places like this where the road system is bad, it's perfect for doing healthcare, you know, medical aid, food aid, disaster relief, and even ecotourism. So when we looked at the, the big business picture, which we have to do as a startup, this is, the, this is the trend that's happening right now that really is being driven by Amazon. Is that all of us are getting used to same day delivery, next day delivery, two days, very low cost. And everybody else in logistics is trying to figure out how to react to that and how to adapt to this new set of expectations that are being created. And there's this last 100 miles problem. This is really the root problem that I think this new wave of aerospace can solve, is that you know, ground transportation is time consuming and it's limited by traffic, it's limited by terrain. There are these linear routes where all the vehicles have to line up and go in the same, same spot. Um, air transportation is fast 
it's more flexible, it's a more node-to-node -node system, but you still have to go to airports. You know, cargo airlines have to land at airports and then offload onto trucks. Um, and this problem of needing higher performing logistics isn't going away because these days Amazon is shipping about 2 million packages a day. FedEx and UPS, between the two of them, are shipping about 20 million packages a day. And those numbers are going up. So here's a peek at our new aircraft. Um, we call it the Chaparral, and it transports cargo from A to B by air. And here's a little video that we created to show how a delivery is going to work. So one of the things that we are doing that I think is critical and interesting is we've separated the cargo from the aircraft, and so there's a cargo pod that's kind of like the shipping container of our system. And that gets picked up by the aircraft, secured in place, and then the aircraft takes off and flies it to the destination. So it can be preloaded. You don't have to stuff boxes into the belly of the aircraft. It's ready to go. And this is where some of these new technologies come in. So it takes off vertically on six electric motors. There's six so that it's redundant. So if one of them goes out, the aircraft doesn't crash. Um, but once it gets in the air, we need to design, at first, for very long range, and batteries aren't quite up to the task. So we've created a hybrid powertrain, like a Prius, basically, that allows it to go really long range. And it only uses the battery for the takeoff and landing part of the mission. So when it gets ready to land again, the lift rotors turn back on. The final approach comes down vertically. Doesn't need an airstrip. Uh, just basically a helipad sized area, 45 by 45 feet. And we'll scan the landing zone on the way down using the same LiDAR that autonomous cars are using to make sure the landing zone is clear. And then it lowers and releases the cargo pod. This is where, if there's enough time, uh, the recipient can unpack the pod and pack new items back in. Otherwise, they'll just have a second pod that's packed and ready to go and pick that one up and go. But I'm gonna keep moving because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, and I wanna show you another video or two. Um, this is a little more details about the aircraft. Um, key things about it are that it has lower operating costs than manned aircraft and ends up at about the same cost as trucking on the ground, except it's just faster and takes less fuel. So a little bit about my co-founder and myself. We're both engineers. We love figuring out what the opportunities are that new enabling technologies are affording and building products and companies around them. Clint had his own company building uh, high-performance aftermarket parts for Mini Coopers using 3D printing techniques to make these cars go extremely fast. Um, I did a PhD, did research, and then I've uh, been doing startups ever since then. We formed a team uh, by, with people that we already worked with in the drone industry. Um, here's Colin, the designer who some of you might know from CCA. Um, he's great. And uh, here's a sample route. Um, this is the, for a business customer like a UPS or a FedEx. Our system will run routes that take uh, 200 pounds of packages out to business customers that are out in areas where it's not an efficient truck route. So the upshots are there's three time, you get three times as many deliveries a day because it's faster. Um, the fuel efficiency is better than a truck and you just get way more timing options. So you can do multiple pickups a day or a later pickup and still get the cargo back to the concentration point for overnight shipments. Okay, so a little bit about how we've been operating, uh, and how we've been developing this system. First, um, it's a complicated system to build a new aircraft. And we realized really early on, we didn't want to reinvent things that we didn't have to um, because it would just take so much longer. So in a way, we operate like a small aerospace prime where we get subcontracting companies who already do something very well to build pieces of the problem like battery system or rotor head or motor, motor controller. 
And it's just like what you do in software where you, know, you wouldn't recreate the operating system or the messaging layer. Like you get the things that work and then build the part that's unique. So that's, what, that's the way we're approaching this problem. And we're leveraging that supply chain from automotive, from the autonomous vehicle industry. So here's a little peek into our testing. Um, we have permission to test down at the Half Moon Bay Airport, down along Highway 1. And some of the things that we're doing are building out subsystems of the final aircraft to validate them along the way to building a full-sized aircraft. So this is a big hovering system that we built to prove that we would get the same amount of lift that we calculated from each rotor, uh, and then also to understand how loud the system is going to be in practice. Because in order to operate in urban environments, it's going to be important that the systems are not as loud as today's helicopters. And then to get around the FAA restrictions around flying heavier than 55 pound autonomous uh, drones, we have we built this system on a vertical rail that it would keep it constrained. So it's a hover test, but it wasn't technically a hover test. It was, it was tied down. So this is really thrilling, the first time we sent this up. Uh, and it confirmed to us that the numbers we were calculating for rotor lift checked out and that it was actually pretty quiet. You know, we were measuring with a, with a dB meter and it, it didn't substantially go above the sound of the road next to us where trucks were driving by. So this is one example of how, how we validate, you know, a system like this that's it's going to be expensive to build full-size versions of it. So there's a lot, of, a lot of individual system validation we have to do along the way to make sure that when we build the full thing, it's going to work. Um, so we do a lot of CAD, a lot of modeling, a lot of simulation, um, a lot of just ideation and sketching. So this is uh, one of like a thousand drawings that, uh, that our design director has done to figure out like the ergonomics and the UX of loading and unloading this cargo pod. How's it going to work? How's the pod going to get connected to the aircraft? So there's a lot of interesting, uh, you know, industrial design, product design questions that go into a new system like this. But it is pretty interesting because uh, as an industrial designer, Colin is used to having a pretty big say on how a thing's going to look. But in aviation, a lot of that is so determined by physics that there's just not a lot of leeway to change how the actual aircraft is going to look. Um, so there's some, but a lot of his work has been in this usability of like how people will interact with the system. We also build physical prototypes. This is an early prototype of a latching system that picks up cargo pods and brings them up underneath the aircraft. This is a, a couple prototypes later. Uh, ground navigation and latching system so the aircraft can drive over a cargo pod and pick it up and latch it in place. And then here's a subscale aircraft, which is about a one-fifth scale drone flying last week at an experimentation uh, venue that we were at. So this is another thing that we can do, and it's pretty common in aerospace, to create you know, miniature aircraft that are similar to the full one in, in different ways. So this is aerodynamically pretty similar and allows us to, to practice and try out the basic control setup. Because you know, this is different than little camera drones like the DJI ones you might have seen because it goes up vertically and then it transitions uh, from that rotorcraft mode into a wing-based mode, more like, a, you know, like an airplane. So that was the transition that you saw in the beginning, then it cruises around and then it will transition back to hovering and come down and land. All right, uh, this is our office. This is where we build the big stuff. And uh, oh, one other uh, interesting design thing. We built this 
uh, industrial design model pretty early on, once we had figured out the, the overall configuration of the aircraft. And um, you know, those of you who have contact with industrial design won't be surprised to know that it made a big difference to show to customers, it made a big difference to show this to investors, and people could walk around and see this aircraft at full scale. It really helped people understand, oh, I get it. Um, so anyway, to wrap it up, uh, you know, we believe this is the time when aviation can actually enter the next phase because of some of the enabling technologies like the electric and hybrid powertrain, uh, the autonomous flight that's possible now, perception coming out of autonomous vehicles. And we think it'll be first for cargo rather than human passengers. So we're building this new aircraft. We're going to serve communities all around the world with air logistics that are not otherwise well served by the ground today. And uh, we're going to change how logistics works to the benefit of everyone, from the remote Alaskan village to people getting their e-commerce packages. That's all. Thank you very much.